sound design. It's always cheaper to design it right the first time. Sound design. Sound Design Live is produced independently by me, Nathan Lively, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Welcome to Sound Design Live, the home of the world's best online training and sound system tuning that you can do at your own pace from anywhere in the world. I'm Nathan Lively, and today I'm joined by the founder of SIA Acoustics and SIA Software, the originator of Smart, Sam Burkow. Sam, welcome to Sound Design Live. Thanks. Happy to be here. So Sam, I definitely want to talk to you about acoustic, sound system design and optimization, um, your audio analyzer pet peeves. But first, what is your favorite track to play after you get a new sound system installed and calibrated? Oh, it's such a good question. Um, I actually have published a list that I update. It used to be on the SI Acoustics website. I don't know. But I have... um, not so much a favorite track as requirements for a favorite track. Okay. <laughs> um, what I do is I start with tracks that are very sparse. The type of track where there, I'm looking for has lots of separation between instruments, lots of details, um, not layers of reverbs and tons of instrumentation. I start with a, a, a great African recording from Ali Fakatori and Tomani Diambate called uh, from an album called In the Heart of the Moon. And it's a Cora and guitar, acoustic guitar duo. And what's beautiful about it is that it covers a wide range of frequencies and you have lots and lots of detail in the strings. There's a Diane Reeves recording from um, a movie soundtrack uh, that it was an Edward Murrow movie called Good Luck and Good Night. And it's uh, one more for my baby, one more for the road. Uh, a really beautifully recorded wooden bass where you have lots of string sound and that great wooden bottom and her voice, which is a little sibilant and wonderful. And you start to recognize immediately whether it's too sibilant or whether the bass is boomy. And if you feel that wooden sort of wonderful sound and the articulation of the strings. It's quarter to three. There's no one in the place. And then, you know, uh, Galactic has a track called Black Eyed Pea which has great uh, uh, snare drum sounds, Stanton Moore being one of my favorite drummers. Uh, You know, you pick a couple of a dozen songs to put in your system tuning folder. And the sad part is you never get to listen to those songs for fun again. <laughs> <laughs> just, just learn to hate them. Like, oh, I don't want to listen to this song again. I think, I think it's really important to have um, that well-recorded representative type of song for the music that you're looking for so that you can listen deconstructively to the relative levels of the instruments. Right. Well, Sam, I would love to know how you got your first job in audio. Like, what was your first paying gig? Wow. I, I think I started mixing when I was in high school, local bands. And I think my first real paying gig was uh, when I was in college. Um, the Zobo Fun Band, which was a guitar player named David Torn, who's still around doing all sorts of crazy stuff. And I ran into it, Nam, a couple of years ago. And I think that was one of my first gigs. And then um, actually about the same time, uh, a friend of mine was working at the Stanhope House in New Jersey, which is a small old house venue uh, dedicated to blues. And the great Willie Dixon was playing. And 
uh, we got there early in the afternoon and Willie got there and Willie was a huge guy with big sausage fingers and used basically a tree trunk as a walking stick. <laughs> and he came up the front porch stairs. We were sitting there playing guitar and, uh, he's like, uh, play me some blues, you know, and, uh, my friend Ronnie was a great guitar player and he played a little, some blues and Willie sang along and, and Ronnie said, Hey, we're your sound crew for tonight. And I was like, Listen, anything you need for monitors, let me know. And we said, monitors? Just confuse me. <laughs> ah, you, you make it good, sound good for the people out front, and I'll take care of the band. <laughs> awesome. And I love that. He was great. Um, I'm wondering if there's one point we could find um, that really made a change for you. So looking back on your career so far, what's one of the best decisions that you made to really get more of the work that you love. I, I, I remember I was uh, working at Cornell University as a technician in a particle physics lab, believe it or not. Wow. And I was living there over the summer and trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life and um, uh, mixing a band and working with a band called Frozen Concentrate, of all things, and uh, mixing other bands. And I was, one of my friends was, uh, installing a studio in New York City. So I drove down from Ithaca and uh, realized it wasn't the studio that sounded bad. It wasn't the equipment. I had a soldering gun in my hand. I was under the console. And it was the room. Mm -hmm. And I went to the library, and there really wasn't very much in the way of good material about what do you do to fix a room and design a room? It was all very mathematical. It wasn't architectural. It wasn't, hey, your wall should splay at this angle. It was like the modal distribution of blah, blah, blah. And so it wasn't very practical. And I started calling around and asking people. And that's how I found Artec and found Russell Johnson, who became my mentor in acoustics, uh, one of the great concert hall designers of all times. At the same time, I was listening to a lot of hippie rock bands, um, one in particular, and uh, Don Pearson was their system engineer. And I literally wrote Don a letter saying, hey, why, why do these systems sound different to me than all the other systems? What are you doing that's so different? And you know, uh, Don was one of the founders of Ultrasound which was very much involved with Meyer Sound Lab and the Grateful Dead. They were doing lots of experiments with early beam steering and uh, different loudspeaker configurations and um, uh, different equalization system tuning methods. And so uh, reaching out to Don was really important. Reaching out to Artec, I literally called and said, hey, I want to learn about rooms and how, what you guys do. And they invited me to visit. And I just didn't want to leave. I said, like, what do I do to get a job here? And like, go get a master's degree. And <laughs> oh, wow. I applied to grad school the next day. Wow. Literally. That's great. It seems, like, it seems like this decision you made was a decision to pursue learning like intensely. And that's what kind of pushed you into uh, this path and these relationships that otherwise you may not have. Yeah, I'm I'm interested in learning things. It's just before we started here, I'm w with two of the guys from SIA going over the fundamentals of multi-time window transfer functions. And, you know, you don't need to know why gasoline burns to drive a car, <laughs> right? But, but it helps if you understand the fundamentals of, you know, how cars work and how they respond. To, sure. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, it's it's sort of fun to get a little deeper than just looking at the results. So, Sam, you per started pursuing this path of trying to understand rooms and how sound systems work in rooms and design. And fast forward to now, you've managed to build a business that successfully marries these two things, acoustic consultancy and system design integration. And I noticed my own reaction when I went to your website. I thought, oh, uh, he's put these two jobs together. And I thought, oh, yeah, these jobs, in my mind, these jobs are normally two separate people. Why wouldn't they be the same person? And so I'm going to read something from your website, and then I'm going to ask you to talk about it because I don't want you to have to repeat yourself too much. So on, you have a FAQ section on your site, and it says, what is the role of an acoustic consultant? 
And the answer is an acoustic consultant's role is to help the client identify, document, develop, and implement the acoustical needs of a project. This includes room acoustical treatments, ambient noise management, isolation between sound critical spaces. And then right after that, it says, what's the role of a sound system designer and how does that relate to acoustics? A sound system designer is responsible for determining the technical infrastructure, specifying the equipment, and generating specifications for use by an installer to implement the design intent. We consider a successful sound system to be one that is seamlessly integrated with the acoustical design. Building a great sounding venue requires consideration of these two systems together. So it seems like these two jobs would always go hand in hand, um, but I think that they don't. So is that because sound system design is a much younger field? So could you talk about what separates and joins these two? A lot of it has to do with the availability of tools. System optimization tools, when I started out, were incredibly clunky and expensive. The first you know, measurement tool I saw was a TEF machine. And you know, I didn't understand time delay spectrometry, and I tried to understand it, and it was way complex. And when you started saying, "Well, how does this relate to setting up a sound system?" It, it, you know, people would give you different answers. But at the end of the day, the the I think the the big question for me was having to talk to two people, Alexander Yule Thornton II, we call him Thorny, and Don Pearson. And both of the, uh, Thorny was the sound system designer for Pavarotti and the three tenors. And Don was the system engineer for the Grateful Dead. And their job was to get a system up in the air, you know, off the trucks, up in the air, and then ready for sound check at four o'clock or five o'clock. And they had a 30 minute window to set delays in EQs or a 45 minute window if they were lucky. And, you know, a Grateful Dead sound systems, even in those days, had 17 zones of loudspeakers. Well, how do you do 17 zones of loudspeakers and look at interactions? Um, it was hard. So they tried B and K analyzers, and John Meyer came up with SIM, uh, SIM 1, and then SIM 2. And uh, they were looking for different things. Um, I think the Teff machine and Dick Heiser were looking for bench test equipment, really. Um, and one of the things that Russell Johnson had focused on was what was called coupled room design, where you had a concert hall with a main space where the audience sat, and then you had a secondary chamber that wrapped around it. And some of the examples of this are the Meyerson Symphony Center in Dallas, Birmingham Symphony Hall in Birmingham, England, uh, the Hall in Lucerne, Switzerland, uh, the Hall in Philadelphia. There are lots of these halls that Russell built over the years and Artec built. And what happened was you wanted to measure broadband signals over very long periods of time. Well, time delay spectrometry gives you very, very narrow frequency range over a long period of time. So I wanted to look at three, four, five seconds of decay broadband. And so we used to literally shoot a gun, and there was a researcher who cut the barrel off of a gun and used special black powder blanks. He called it a gub. Okay. And you, you would use it, and some people would pop balloons to make an impulse, and you'd record it. And the problem was they weren't particularly repeatable, and you couldn't control the directionality of the sources very well. And um, the, the point was that there weren't great tools, and if they were great tools, they were very expensive and hard to use. So uh, for me, I was being driven by my friends who had a real need for practicality, mm -hmm. you know, get a system up, make it sound great, versus wanting to be scientifically rigorous, and at the same time, get data that helps you understand rooms. You know, you use smart. How often do you look at an impulse response to find reflections? Rarely. Yeah, you know, right. Most people don't, mm -hmm. right? Well, why is that? I would think it would be a useful thing to be able to die. Well, because you're not much you can do about them. And built into your, you know, multi-window transfer function, you're really only looking at the loudspeaker at high frequencies, and you're looking at the interaction of the system with other parts of itself and the room at low frequencies. 
And so this idea of varying time windows is one that's sort of transparent to the user. You don't see that happen. That's the gasoline burning in the engine. You just step on the gas and see the car move, right? right. You look at your transfer function, you say, oh, I've got a residence at this frequency. I've got it. Um, I told you this story, and, and I think it's an interesting one, where um, I was asked to work on a recording studio for a musician who I've known as band for 30, 40 years, and uh, I've been a fan of. And they said, oh, you don't have to come and make measurements because we already had someone make smart measurements. And I'm going, yeah, but I'm going to make different measurements. And they're like, no, no, we don't want to pay someone to do something that's already been done. And I'm going. It hasn't been done, you know? <laughs> I'm sure of it, and, yeah. And, and, and the reason was the guy who did it was a sound system guy who really wasn't looking for modal, how to identify modal analysis. And one of the things that you and I spoke about briefly was I often take a microphone and put it in the floor in the corner of a room to help identify modes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've had a chance to try it yet, but it, it's a very effective thing to do. And so, you know, you put up a modal calendar and you see the frequencies and um, uh, and they show up pretty regularly. It's pretty, pretty interesting thing to see. So I want to ask you more about that modal research, but just to wrap up what we were talking about, um, the combining of these two jobs, it sounds like the advancement in tools has allowed acousticians to also be sound system designers. I, I, my hope was that smart would do a lot of that for people that it would help people because the transfer function inherently at mid and low frequencies is looking at the interaction of the room and the system and at high frequencies is looking at just the system i was sort of hoping that as a tool smart would bring those two things together and the fact that you could measure an impulse response and then break that impulse response down into different frequency ranges and identify reflections and modes and decay rates. And um, one of the most important things I think in room acoustics is what we call tonal balance. And Leo Baranek came up with a definition where uh, you look at the mid low frequency decay and compare it to the mid high frequency decay and there's a ratio that he liked and we modified that to saying all right take 500 1k and 2k and average it and then look at the 125 hertz decay and see if you're within 35 or 40 percent of the number you got from the average so we came up with our own variation on Baranek's rule but the idea of low frequency decay being in some sort of reasonable balance with high frequency decay in a room to me is critically important mm -hmm. and a very, very important design tool and something that's easy to measure and smart. Well, let's talk more about smart because yeah. um, I know that you have some pet peeves about the way people use audio analyzers. And I think we could get back now into talking about modal research because you saw an article that I published recently where I was attempting to do modal research um, using averaged impulse responses. And you said, no, 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 you can actually do that with uh, the transfer function. So, and right. put your microphone in this position. So tell me more about that. Yeah, I, I find it harder to look for. I, I mean, I'll, there are things that are right and wrong, and then there are things that are techniques, right? So like, there's no right or wrong uh, for a lot of these things. They're like, what works for you and how you see the data? And then there are things that sort of just make more sense, right? So one of my pet peeves is when you're looking at a transfer function, set the grid to be an octave grid. And as I tell people, if it's a logarithmic grid and you see a peak and you want to know how wide it is in octaves because you're going to set an EQ, it's really hard to judge if you're looking at a logarithmic grid. If you have an octave grid, you, every two grid lines or you know, every grid line is an octave apart from any other grid line. So if the resonance is wider than two grid lines, it's more than an octave. And if it's narrower, it's whatever fraction narrower, and you can instantly get data. So then the idea is that if you look at a peak in between those two lines, then you already know, okay, I'm gonna need a filter that is about an octave. Right. If, if there, if there's wide as two 
lines, two grid lines, it's an octave wide. And if it's half as wide, it's half an octave. And if it's narrower, it's narrower. And so you instantly know the width of your resonance. Okay, great. Yeah, that makes more sense now. I was trying, I thought you t- were talking about switching to a linear uh, layout. No. And I started looking at that. I was like, no, that's way different. No. <laughs> well, audi- audiologists like linear because of okay. you know the way they look at phones and things. But for, for uh, acoustics and sound system tuning, uh, uh, octave grid works really well for me. And I think, it, I think it makes sense. Um, my biggest pet peeve is people looking at the screen and not listening. And, you know, I hear that all the time. I mean, people go in and go, Oh God, another guy is going to stare at a screen and not listen. And I mean, I, I just won't, I, I don't want to do that. If I have to be in a separate room, like a control room, for example, I walk out and go walk out and listen and then come back. And, you know, ideally I'll have a wireless control of my system parameters. But, you know, I'm always using the tool to help my mind and my ear understand what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. You know, there are things that are quantitative, measuring delays. Like, you don't have to go out there, you measure the delay, you line it up, right? You check the levels, you look at the EQ, you look at the frequency response, you look at the impulse response. You know, you don't need to be in the room to check the delay times. Any other pet peeves you wanted to cover that you see people um, out there doing or, or you used to do yourself? Um, yeah, I guess there's one one pet peeve is not differentiating between the acoustical crossover point and the electronic crossover point. Oh, sure. And so one of the things that I like to do with smart is go high, mid, low, sub. Right, I like to go band by band. Now, with a lot of today's self-powered speaker systems, that's hard to do, right? And um, even going zone by zone in an array is hard to do because they the array interacts reacts differently. Its directionality is a function of all of the low frequency drivers being on all the mid-frequency drivers being on, and only the very high-frequency drivers are acting independently. Um, That's even changing with these immersive arrays and with these adaptive arrays, which are a whole new fun technology that we've been playing with a lot. Um, The ability to look at how the subwoofer crosses over is not just a function of the crossover frequency in the electronic crossover, but is a function of the relative level of the subwoofer and the low frequency device. Mm -hmm. So if you have 80 hertz as your de facto crossover point and your subwoofer is at 6 or 8 dB above your low frequency device, your acoustic crossover frequency will be much lower than if you turn the subs up 10 or 12 dB more, like for a heavy-duty rap house EDM type show, right? So what you've done is you've kept the electronic crossover at one frequency and slid the acoustic crossover frequency up by changing the gain of the... um, of the subwoofer relative to the low frequency device. And I think people might want to be more aware of that. I think you create a lot of mud in those cases by having the subs go so much higher. Um, I actually like to go and do outside the bandpass EQs on the subwoofers to cut out those frequencies that are interacting to make deeper crossovers. Uh, oh, and interesting. Reduce, yeah, and reduce the amount of energy that the sub and the low frequency device might be uh, both generating. Mm-hmm. Sam, is it cheaper to make a room quieter or make the sound system louder? That depends <laughs> on the type of music and, and the budget. And uh, that's, a, that's such a loaded question. I know. <laughs> um, for, for, for classical music and for acoustic music, new acoustic music, um, I think having rooms that are relatively quiet is really important. You know, jazz at Lincoln Center, like NC five or 10 or something crazy. The subway's below it. It's on, the whole room is floating inside the Time Warner Center. Um, 
the SF Jazz Center uh, didn't have that type of problem of the subway, but we had traffic and they have a glassed in room. So we built and floated the Joe Henderson lab, but we didn't float the main venue. We just took great pains to isolate uh, all the penetrations. Um, I, so I think for rooms where tone and nuance and musical interaction are really important, and particularly classical music, where the audience gets quiet together, um, you know, being below NC20 is really important. Um, for a rock and roll room like Brooklyn Bowl, uh, you know, where most of the shows are in the, you know, 85 to 105 dB range, you know, does it really matter if you're, you know, NC30? No, I think it's fine. Um, but you don't want to be NC45. And depending on how much you're broadcasting and, you know, how much noise there is on stage and how much recording you're doing, uh, ambient noise does become uh, a big issue. And so trying to balance the cost of making things quiet with the cost of the uh, function of the room is really a, a bit of a game, a bit of a, a balancing act. Um, I think making rooms quiet makes them sound better. Uh, but if the show is 110 dB, I don't think it makes any difference. And I'm sure you've seen rooms go both ways. If there's a limited budget, it, that budget might be best applied to making the room quieter and working on um, noise isolation or acoustics. Um, and sometimes that budget might be best spent on a new sound system or, you know, or a split of both. Yeah, I mean, it comes down to the function of the room and how much it impacts. We had a client who wanted to build a production, a television production studio recently, and we went out to visit the site, and it was in the flight path of an airport. <laughs> you know? I mean, you know, it's not practical you know, to try and film high-quality production television in a room where there's a flyover every three minutes yeah you know it's shaking the building flyover now does that matter if it's a rehearsal hall for guys jamming out and doing some light recording it's it, so understanding the priorities making rooms quiet falls into two big tasks right um acoustic isolation walls ceilings floors uh, isolated floors have gotten so much better and so much less expensive in the last 15 years because there's so many great materials available uh, that are very cost effective and really work well. Okay. Um, you know, making air conditioning quiet, uh, inline duct silencers have become much lower pressure drop, not as low as the standards say they should be, but, you know, that's a whole other issue about the way standards are measured for these things but um you know you can get inline duct silencers for under a thousand dollars now that are very effective um and they help also help keep sound in your uh, from breaking out of your room as well as keeping airflow noise uh from uh being a problem okay so there are great tools so you sort of have to break it down into air conditioning versus isolation, you know, what's practical, what, you know, we, we like to do for recording studios and production facilities, span ceilings. You know, um, there's a great facility in Boulder, Colorado called E-Town, and they have a stage 220-seat room, and they have, you know, bluegrass and rock bands on that stage. And uh, one time we had... Uh, Los Lobos rocking out on the stage. The upstage wall is common to a recording studio, which we had to isolate. And they had, you know, 10 large format condenser microphones open recording an acoustic music ensemble. And literally on the other side of several layers of walls was this rock band. Wow. And they were able to do their recording without interference. Um, actually surprised me it worked that well, um, the isolation. But the decision was made that you had to be able to operate both facilities at the same time because scheduling was going to make it not worth building. So 
raise more money, put it into isolating spaces. Sure. Sam, can you explain the NC specification that you were mentioning earlier? Yeah, um, NC is a noise criteria, and it's a series of curves where you make octave band measurements, and you, the curve you stay under is the one that you uh, use as your number. So NC is just a metric that takes uh, your frequency. Like STC, sound transmission class, is a rating for walls and windows and doors and their ability to block sound. NC is a single number to uh, indicate the ambient noise level. Uh, it, it, because the curves are based on Fletcher Munson and human hearing, it allows more low frequencies where your ear is less sensitive at lower levels to have more energy. And um, it's a, a nice metric. What's interesting recently in working with um, Robert Director Associates, the company that SI Acoustics joined, an engineering firm that has lots of HVAC and mechanical engineers uh, on staff, is that we've been looking at fan power boxes, and we find that it's amazing how you can have similar NC numbers, but different subjective sound levels. So that's wow. a, something I've been looking at recently that's very interesting. And so when you're working on these projects, a lot of times, I'm assuming you'll have a goal for an NC level, or you might get that told to you by the client that's hiring you, or you might be designating that in the, you know, the building project. Is that right? Yeah, it, it happens every way. What, what we've been doing recently is um, surveying uh, existing facilities and saying, okay, your conference rooms are at NC30, your general open office areas are at NC35, and coming up with basic ideas. And what's interesting is that, you know, trying to explain why you want to make an air conditioning system quiet and then add noise masking, you know, and, and that's sort of an interesting thing. Um, I, uh, noise masking systems are still in use, but they're less popular, but they're also more controlled. And so balancing the needs of privacy and quiet and um, sound transmission are all part of the design priorities. How much you're going to spend on doors and windows, and um, can you design a vestibule into a studio and do two less expensive doors than one really expensive door, for example? Sure, it sounds like there's a lot of elements in the balance here that um, affect the end result, and so you could spend more on the doors, spend more on the AC, spend more on the windows this and that, and you find a, a balance to get the result that you want. Yeah, we have a, a young man working with us, a guy named C Tyler Cottrell, and it drives him out of his mind. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's sitting behind me over here and uh, gritting his teeth, but it, he, gets, he gets very, um, you know, he gets very like, how do we address the fact that we're trying to achieve all these different goals? And um, he wrote a very great memo to someone uh, that I read yesterday or the day before saying, look, this wall system that has this great STC rating is wonderful, but all of the tests that the manufacturer sent you don't include doors, <laughs> right? Like it, it's a great wall until you put a door in it. And because it was a glass based wall and they want to have invisible seals, you know, you're going to pay a price in terms of isolation and they selected this so having this conversation is okay you also have to worry about the fact that we're penetrating this wall with a bunch of ducks so how many penetrations and do you need a duck silencer is there a transfer grill mm -hmm. um this is a uh there's a really cute story about a uh company in uh the greater los angeles area where they built a very expensive conference room and the CEO came in to give uh, his first talk to his, you know, Minions. executive team. Mm -hmm. And they were sitting there as he's about to start talking. And they're hearing people tell jokes in the lobby outside the room. Oh, wow. And no one had bothered to tell the mechanical engineer that you can't put a transfer grill 
on the wall of this room. So there's literally a hole in the wall above <laughs> this acoustical ceiling. And the area above the acoustical ceiling is just an open plenum, right, which is an acoustical tile ceiling, and there's a grill, and the return air comes up, goes through that grill. And so you walk in the room, you look up, and you can actually look through the grill, see the transfer grill in the vertical wall, and see the chandelier in the lobby. Oh, wow. You know, so things like transfer duct systems that have X, either one or two turns that are aligned can give you a great deal of isolation at a very low cost. Okay. They just have to be included in the design. Someone has to prioritize, prioritize privacy. So we spend a lot of time trying to think about how important is this privacy, you know? How important is it to have critical adjacencies? We visited a law firm where their main boardroom had an ungasketed door and it was directly across from the lunchroom area. Yeah. Well, I mean, of course, now they're having private conversations and they're being inundated with noise from the lunchroom and people in the lunchroom can hear the presentations. This is, you know, now we've got a problem. <laughs> and, you know, so it's like, it's always cheaper to design it right the first time. Sam, it's fun for us to talk about all the great things that you've done in your career and all these projects that have really succeeded. But I think it can also be important to take a look back at some of the things that didn't work out so well. So I wonder if you'd be willing to tell us about the biggest or maybe most painful mistake you've made on the job and then maybe how you recovered from that. Um, we did a large event for a large church group. And I don't know if this was really our fault, but they sent us a map of the seating area that we were supposed to cover with a sound system and then put 5,000 more people in the areas behind the stage and no one told us. So there's no loudspeaker system covering these areas. And that's a nightmare because there's not, what, what are you going to do? Sure. Like you can't make more gear magically appear. Um, so what happened? Uh, those people didn't hear. Uh -huh. I mean, it was just, it was, you know, we were asked to provide a sound system to cover X area and uh, we did. And so the mistake and, you made was not reading their minds and telling the future. Right. I mean, I think, I think that at some point or another, the you know you have to be aggressive about asking the questions are you sure there're not going to be people here right like i mean i i guess that's that's one of the most frustrating experiences i've ever had cuz when you're there you just feel horrible i sure. mean you just feel terrible um okay so jason says does he have any advice and or opinions on using fir filters in system design and optimization what is an example use case um, I love FIR filters. The challenge with FIR filters is delay. You know, complex FIR filters that address low frequencies uh, introduce a lot of delay. That's the big problem. Um, you start running into lip sync problems with video. You start running into problems. I'm a big believer in delaying the um, main system to the back line of rock bands. Right, particularly in mid, I don't think it matters so much at Madison Square Garden, but like, for example, Lenny Kravitz was playing the Roseland Ballroom, and Ted Leamy, who was uh, now at Claire, one of the big guys at Claire, but he was with Ultrasound Pro Media for many, many years, and JBL before that, and Electrotech before that, uh, brought me in uh, to play with Smart and we pushed the main PA back to the drummer's monitor, which was as loud as the guitar amps. They were all at the back line there. Mm -hmm. And the difference it made to delay the system that seven or eight milliseconds, because so much sound was coming off the stage, really affected the front of the audience. Um, we had a similar experience when I first met John O'Leary and the guys from the String Cheese incident uh, when they were doing shows in Boulder and I taught a smart class up at uh, Wind Over the Earth and at Airshow Mastering. And 
uh, we went down and pushed the PA back and aligned it with the back line of the band. And the people up front weren't stopped hearing two snare drums. <laughs> right? So, um, you know, because they were playing a thousand seat or you know, Boulder Theater or Fox Theater, one of those. Um, so, I mean, uh, I don't have a problem adding delay. The problem is that the power of FIR filters is that you can do very complicated minimum phase filters that match the response exactly that you want to get rid of. But um, delay times that they can introduce get extreme, and that's the big problem with them. Kual Tamak says, what are his thoughts on immersive installations and their future? Will it last? So I'm not sure exactly what he's referring to. Do you have anything I, to say I, about I do. That? I okay. do know what he's referring to. Um, I think that the people at uh, the leading audio companies are looking for ways to make the audio experience in concert venues more like the movie experience. And the folks at L Acoustics with their Lisa system, DMB has a similar system. I think Meyer has a similar system um, where you are not just panning, but you're creating a series of energy distribution models that uh, you put five arrays across the front and then arrays on the side, arrays above. And your, I'm, hang on, your magic box that your, that company is selling you takes these inputs and you tell it where the people are and it pans so that people across the spectrum are able to, across the, the seating spectrum, uh, experience stereo style or image based sound um for playback only systems like in dome seatings uh it can be a really exciting experience um there's a dome in la uh the people at the hayden planetarium did some wonderful shows with mickey hart where he played live to tracks uh and things were swirling around and uh i think it's super fun mark knopfler's last tour uh was amazing i mean it was just great having you know feeling like his guitar was there or there or there and he didn't move around a lot but when he did it shifted and uh there was that sense of being enveloped by sound that you don't always get um one of the best sounding shows i've seen in years uh was david burns uh, American Utopia on Broadway. Oh, cool. And they did an amazing job, uh, amazing job of uh, making uh, all the band is marching around. They're all wireless. I think it's 58 or 60 some channels of wireless going. And I can just imagine the headaches of keeping that all up in Times oh, Square. Wow. And they've done it. It's spectacular. And I really wonder what would happen if they took that from stereo and did an immersive version. Mm, okay. You know, now I don't know that the sight lines work in a Broadway theater for, you know, five large arrays. I think they'd lose sight lines to the back of the, the stage for people sitting in the balcony. Um, but I would have liked, I, while I was there, I thought, this is wonderful. I wonder what it would like to have more surround. Broadway sound designers have done uh, excellent work with uh, immersive and surround uh, work. Um, there was a show called The Band's Visit. Uh, Kai Herrera was the sound designer. And it was just, you were swimming in sound. It was emotional. It was, in, that sense of envelopment is something that I really like. And I think that um, can be achieved can it be achieved really well for a one-off? I don't know. I think that as bands do residencies, it's probably easier to do where you can set it up and program it or corporate events where there's a production team involved. Um, so yes, I don't think immersive audio is going away anytime soon. I think we're going to see more and more of it. I like it. Um, what I also really like is adaptive audio these systems where you not only control the 
vertical dispersion of the arrays, but you can control the horizontal and the vertical dispersion of the arrays. And you tell the system, I want sound here, and I don't want sound there. And one of the great examples of that is one of the projects that we've done recently, which is Pier 17 here in New York City, which is a 4,000-seat rooftop rock and roll venue that's a couple of hundred yards from very expensive apartments that don't want to hear the show. Mm -hmm. And so using an adaptive system, we use the Anya system for that one, um, allows us to control high and low frequencies, both vertically and horizontally, oh, cool. and do shows and not uh, piss off neighbors to any <laughs> great extent. So, uh, you know, I think that's another technology that's um, just becoming affordable and and well designed and you know with good software and reliable and all the things you need it to be um cool so i want to know what's in your work bag there's probably a lot of fun tools you could talk about but could you just pick out maybe a couple of unique or interesting things that you use in your job or that you take to job sites that that you could tell us about you know i i really don't have a very fancy uh toolkit anymore because i'm not doing a lot of um i'm not doing a lot of like getting into racks and you know uh troubleshooting systems um other people are doing that um i have some good measurement mics like what uh, i still use the earthworks i still have a couple of b and k's floating around yeah the studio six mic uh the one that works with smart um, for making, you know, you know, mid-level NC measurements mm -hmm. on an iPhone works really well. Uh, nice product, very affordable. Um, I have uh, Don Pearson's Hilti laser measurer. Uh, Don and I bought it together, and then he stole it from me. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, when he passed away, I took it back. Okay. So uh, I still go out, and uh, I needed it yesterday. But uh, a good laser measuring device is a nice thing to have. There are a couple of new um, measuring tools and modeling tools uh, that are all interesting. You know, people doing 3D mapping of rooms with drones. And uh, I'd like to start doing more of that uh, in big facilities. Um, but really, uh, the, the best thing I think we have is a strategy for approaching projects. Um, I tell people, if you're going to go out and optimize a system, you should have a step-by-step -step process in your head that, you know, you can go down. Like, okay, what's the goal of this, right? Make sure everything's working. Get it to sound as linear as possible. Make it as easy to mix on as possible. Make it uh, the system not fight itself, right? You walk in, it's a stereo system. You know, what do you do? All right, put up a measurement mic in front of a cluster, turn the cluster on and play some music and see what it sounds like. Measure the cluster in on axis, just the right side, all right? Maybe you look at it in two or three locations. See if there's anything looks funky. Bring the highs, the mids, or, you know, is everything in polarity, the different bands? right? Turn the subs off, turn the subs on. Are they combining properly? Do they look like there's a, a reasonable amount of overlap? Get that cluster set up. Move to the other side, listen to it. Do you hear any problems? If not, copy your settings from the right over to the left. See if it sounds the same, if it measures the same, right? If it does, take your initial measurement spot on your right cluster and measure with both clusters on and see how they're interacting. All right, so this is a process, a measurement process that we have, a step-by-step -step process. Is, are the speakers in zones? Can we turn off highs and lows? You know, is, are there front fills that need to be delayed in? And are there delay speakers that need to be uh, timed in and EQ'd? How, you know, how loud do you want them to be? You know, there's a lot of talk about things like Haas effect. I'm like, just get them on time. <laughs> yeah. Right? Just get don't, the time dead on. Don't make it complicated. <laughs> right. It, you know, look at the EQ of the system with the the, the the delay speaker off. 
then look at with the system on. Um, I carry a rubber mallet with me. Believe it or not, the company calls it a deadhead, uh -oh. <laughs> which always cracks me up. I'll, I'll send you a picture. I kept okay. a sticker that says deadhead. I use a rubber mallet to bang on walls. Uh, we recently worked on a, a very upscale auditorium that does both live events and projection events. And so they have a very high-end loudspeaker system, and it was in a very resonant wall. And it took me one hit with the palm of my hand on this wall to know that there was a problem. And I took a rubber mallet and I hit the wall, and the wall went bong. Wow. Right? You know, there's no isolation between the loudspeakers and this wall. They're sitting in recesses. There's no treatment in the recesses, you know. Sam, what is one book that has been immensely helpful to you? I read that question. You sent me that question, and I was trying to come up with a really good answer. And I was going to say Love is a Dog from Hell, a collection of poems by Charles Bukowski. Okay, sure. <laughs> um, you know, there, I don't, I, there, I use all of, I, I have a half a dozen acoustical reference books. They're all great. Um, the first one I got was Sound System Engineering by Don Davis. Um, there's a bunch of them that are good. Bob McCarthy's books are well worth reading. Um, you know, it's funny. Um, uh, language in audio changes from book to book, where the crossover region is what I call the overlap, the coverage overlap region. A crossover is a frequency dividing network in some places, and it's a overlap of coverage area in, in other books. But more importantly than any book was understanding the priorities of people who were using rooms, doing shows. Uh, you know, if anyone had acoustical influence on me more than anything else was working with Russ Johnson and listening with him. Um, there was a great recording engineer, Helmut Colby, a CBS masterwork engineer, and he could ruin any record for you. Like, you'd listen to it, and he'd point out all the flaws in the performance. Oh, man. And, um, I, I got to mix an Ali Jackson record, which featured Wynton Marsalis. And uh, I had worked on the mixes for a while, and I brought it to Bruce Botnick's studio. And I sat down next to Bruce, and he was able to make the mixes a thousand times better than I had in the hours I had spent on it. He, in 15 minutes, had the mixes so much better than anything I could have accomplished. You know, I felt like a neophyte. Um, the late, great Ed Cherney, I got to watch him mix a couple of things and listen and just go, wow. And so it was, you know, it was spending time with the needs, watching people who were really doing shows. Um, when I met Rod Scoville, he had very, developed some tools to help him uh, map his mixes from one console to another by matching buses. And a little spreadsheet worked out with tabs. So he would put in, you know, what he needed and it would tell him what, how many buses and stereo and mono for different consoles. I'm like, this is not a normal guy, right? This is not your normal <laughs> front house mixer. Um, so I've just been really lucky to pick the brains of people. And one of the great things about the acoustics and audio community is that while there are always people who are, it's not invented here, so it's not as good. And I ran into a lot of that with Smart. Um, there are just as many people who are, wow, you're thinking about that? Me too. Here's what I think. Here's, you know, uh, the people who went out of their way to offer me help and support. Um, Sam, do you listen to any podcasts? I do. I listen to a bunch of podcasts. What? Okay, I want to know the ones that you all like. What are the ones you listen to regularly? Like you have to hear you know, you know what? every new episode that comes out. Yeah, I'll tell you. Um, I'm a regular listener to Twit this week in technology. This week in technology is a a good overview of what's happening in the technology world, computers, and uh, you know, cyber issues and that kind of sure. stuff. So uh, that works for me. And of course, you, right? Right. Oh, really? Every episode, episode I got to hear. Every episode, I got to hear. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, Tim, where is the best place for people to follow your work? Uh, SIAacoustics.com uh, is a uh, still active website. The, um, yeah, uh, the Robert Director Associates website will link you to the SIA Acoustics website. Uh, I think that's probably it. We, we keep a Facebook presence. We try to stay online. I try to, I try to give talks at AES. Uh, we did a talk this last year at AES on uh, facility design for multifunction rooms. Uh, that was kind of fun. Um, yeah, that's it. All right, Sam. Well, thank you so much for joining me on Sound Design Live. Yeah, th thank you for having me, and thanks for doing this. Uh, I hope you have a half an hour's worth of good uh, information. Sound Design Live. This episode was edited by Noah Feldman. The music used in this podcast was called Kring by an artist named Wowa. Sound Design Live is supported by Ross, Learn Stage Lighting, John Scott, Pedro Rob, Martin, Rody Free Radio, Joel Ellis, Jim, Sinqui, Terry Nicholas, Kuba Chris, DC Sound Op, and Dave. You can start supporting Sound Design Live today for as little as $1 over at patreon.com slash sounddesignlive.